petition was uh, uh, reasonably uh, sort of concise, so I get 10 more minutes, wonderful. Yeah, I have instructions to, to stop at 10.30. Okay, so I'm obviously very happy to be here once again and uh, honored to do the, the, the opening talk. So today I'm going to talk about a, a topic which I judge to be very important. So really it's a fundamental concept that in my view has been sort of ignored or underappreciated along all those decades of financial mathematics. It's based on some ge geometric concept. I call it so the perils of parametrization. So the main idea is that we often on the market have to price a large collection of uh, very correlated uh, related securities. So it can be different bonds, it can be different options on the uh, underlying asset. And uh, uh, to make sure that it's, uh, the price don't go all over the place, so market makers typically use a parameterization with a few parameters. Uh, so what does it mean? It means that we operate in a space of quite large dimensions. For instance, if you have uh, 50 options, you're in dimension 50. At each point in time, you have a vector of dimension 50. So you have this price vector moving through time. But the fact that we use a parameterization with a few parameters means that this price vector basically remains in, on, on a manifold of low dimension in a high dimensional space. So let me try to explain the kind of problem that you have. It is that if today, sorry, that's a bit too much here. Yeah. So if today uh, the price vector is here, and if you know that tomorrow, let's say, I'm on TV, so it's going to try to be to do it uh, closely. Uh, if you know that tomorrow the the price will be on that manifold here, and if you can separate it by a hyperplane, then it means that you you have a corresponding portfolio which will be guaranteed to make money tomorrow. So you have strong geometric principles, which is that, uh, as I will show, essentially the price vector today has to be outside of, uh, I'm sorry, within the convex hull of the low dimensional manifold tomorrow. So I will show uh, quite a few examples, uh, some linked to the interpolation methods that are used uh, by the market from a few, for instance, uh, futures maturities that are quoted. But if you, if you have to offer price for any broken maturity, typically people are using a parametric interpolation uh, for uh, option pricing, so the, the, the market is using either Black-Scholes or local volatility or Heston model or Sabre, Sabre model. And I will show that uh, there are strong constraints that usually are ignored and kind of surprisingly, very often, the choices made by the market lead to arbitrage, to a dynamic arbitrage. So let's get started. Uh, example, so we have uh, plenty of um, uh, securities being traded in the market. You have uh, thousands of stocks and uh, which are uh, support of uh, options. So it means each one has, has tens or hundreds of options and those things are pretty much quoted in continuous time. So obviously the whole process is automated and uh, it's uh, generated by a few, a few parameters. And uh, uh, again, I will show uh, the, the way it works and the kind of problems it can, uh, it can lead to. So uh, here it's uh, an example of um, on the, so the swaption market. Really the market norm is uh, the Sabre model, which is essentially a stochastic volatility model, but people do not use it because of its dynamical properties, but uh, much more because there are some decent uh, approximation of the prices and the, the implied volatilities it is generating. So this has been uh, largely adopted uh, by the market and actually market makers are using t typical um, values of the parameters every day, recalibrating permanently uh, to, to fit the market. Or more precisely, the, the market is rather generated by a choice of a few parameters. 
So typically here it's a kind of complicated formula, but it's very easy to program and kind of instantaneous to evaluate, which explains the popularity of this model. And you see the market quotes in the, the blue bubbles, and the fit is virtually perfect. Or again, it's just uh, uh, because the, the, it's not a model calibrated to the market, but it's more a market determined by the model. So in, the, in a model, typically you have state variables and uh, parameters. The parameters are supposed to be fixed and uh, they guide the dynamics of the state variables that move according to, to those parameters. When you recalibrate, then you're changing the values of the parameters. They kind of become state variables uh, themselves and we are going to, to see the kind of problems uh, that uh, it leads to. But here it's an example of a uh, Saber uh, parameter uh, uh, values for the parameters. Again, they are supposed to be fixed, but uh, you see that they, they are constantly sort of reevaluated through time and uh, uh, you, they go up and down uh, instead of being fixed. So those values are recalibrated and we'll see the kind of problems it can lead to. Another example here, it was um, the S&P uh, 500 uh, that you see um, in, um, it's in green here. It was on a very violent days, actually in um, last uh, February last year, when uh, the invert, uh, inverse inverse uh, VIX, uh, I think it was XIV, uh, uh, it, it was a note that actually went from uh, it dropped by 96 percent on on a day because of strange things that happened here. But uh, the main point is that even in a very violent market, you see that the, here it's the skew of the, um, the implied volatilities as a function of strike of the different S&P options for the front maturity and the second maturity. And the prices are in blue uh, here. By the way, the VIX value can be seen pretty much, the square of the VIX is pretty much the area under the blue curve. You just have to divide by the K square, the strike square. Uh, so here it was in a kind of uh, normal time. So the, um, the VIX was at 23% and in less than one hour, uh, it went to 46%. It doubled up in one, uh, one hour. So this is uh, after one hour, uh, it, it, it's much higher than before. So leading to a VIX being twice the, the value. Still, you see that all the individual options are very nicely priced. So it means even in, in terms of uh, shocks, uh, the market is following a parametrization. So let's do some um, geometry of uh, portfolios here. When you have a certain number of assets, so n different assets, so there you have a price vector at uh, each point in time, if you constitute a portfolio of this asset, so you may buy and sell some of them, this determines, so actually, uh, it determines a hyperplane which corresponds to the scenarios where you don't make money, you don't lose money. And so you will make money in a half space and uh, lose money in, the, in the, the other one. The price gradient, if you want, the orthogonal to this, uh, this uh, hyperplane. So, uh, the question will be to know if you're currently here. So if you had a model where all the possible scenarios tomorrow uh, or at any later time is contained, confined in a half a space, then it corresponds to an arbitrage. Mm -hmm. So and we'll see uh, uh, the situations where it's happening. So uh, let's assume that the manifold tomorrow has a shape like this. So typically it's within a space of high dimensions, but the manifold is of low dimension. So if, so this is the convex hull here, which is uh, the, the important uh, uh, concept. So if the price vector today is here, so it means you are within the convex hull, it means that you cannot separate the price vector today from the manifold tomorrow uh, through a hyperplane. So actually, it's equivalent to say that you can separate 
the price vector from the hyper the, the manifold, or to say that uh, the current price vector is not in the convex hull. If you're in a situation like this, then you can separate this uh, convex hull from this point by a hyperplane. Well, it's, a, it's an application of the Anbana theorem. And uh, you can uh, interpret this as the isoprofit scenarios of a portfolio. So it means you will be able to constitute a portfolio that makes money here and lose money there. So if you know in advance uh, the parameterization that market is uh, using, so uh, you can exploit it. So um, the problem, usually it's not so easy to compute explicitly the convex hull of a, a manifold, typically. Just to give you an example, even if you're, um, okay, whichever dimension you are, uh, very often, the, even if your manifold is of dimension one, it will curve in different dimensions. And actually, the convex hull will be of a full dimensionality. So it's not, um, it's not uh, necessarily easy conceptually or algorithmically to compute it. But we'll look at the simple cases. So first, I take a trivial case, but actually, uh, whenever you find an arbitrage portfolio, it will boil down to that. But imagine first that you just have a one, one a set, and uh, it has a price uh, here today. And uh, if uh, for some reason, reasons you know that the possible prices tomorrow are uh, just uh, uh, the support is, uh, the, 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 is just on the right hand side here. So the convex hull of the support will be this uh, half line here. And so you can obviously separate the current point to, uh, by this uh, half line. In dimension one, a hyperplane is, what is, what is a hyperplane in dimension one? Hmm? It's a point, yeah, it's a point here. So, and what I mean, it means that you can have a portfolio which would make money here and lose money there. Indeed, it means you buy today, you sell tomorrow. So it looks uh, totally trivial, but eventually, when you have your arbitrage portfolio, it corresponds exactly to a situation like this. Let's look at something slightly more interesting here. <clears throat> so imagine that you have one, uh, one asset, uh, S, and uh, a European type option that gives you a time capital T. It gives you um, a profile G of ST here. So in that case, we have uh, one parameter. Everything will depend purely on the, the, the final price ST. But uh, you have uh, two, two assets. You have the spot price and the option uh, here, which um, uh, gives you everything at the end depends only on ST. Actually, uh, we will assume there is a zero coupon, so you have right, the right uh, to use constants as well. So in this case, uh, if I apply this rule of the convex cell, so it will give me automatically the set of possible arbitrage-free prices today. So what do I do? So my manifold of dimension one is here. The convex hull, so it's the thing with the, the, red, uh, the red dots. And uh, uh, the, sorry, yeah. The current, the, um, uh, the possible uh, price, so the, if the, the price today is S0, we'll see that the possible uh, arbitrage free prices are just uh, the intersection of this convex hull with this vertical line gives us uh, the lower bound and the upper bound. Typically, if the price today was here, so it would correspond to a situation where you're not in, so here the price, so it means the X here is the spot price uh, today, the price today of uh, S, and uh, uh, the Y is the price of the claim. So this is a price vector today. If it's not in the convex hull of the price uh, vectors, of the convex hull of the manifold tomorrow, uh, then you can separate again and create uh, an, uh, a hedge like this. So the trade in that case would be to buy the claim for this premium here, and you sell the hedge uh, here, and uh, whatever happens, so you know that uh, the, um, 
uh, eventually the blue, the, the white curve yeah, is always above this uh, yellow hedge, so you make sure money. So interestingly, so as it's a characterization of this uh, arbitrage freeness, we will find back easily the classical model-free arbitrage, uh, uh, mod arbitrage free um, bonds of uh, Merton, for instance, in the 73 paper, the um, theory of rational option pricing. So here I just give an example to show that a calendar spread, and yet yeah, when you increase the strike uh, of an option, of a call option, the price uh, decreases. So in this case, we have, uh, we'll take just two assets here, uh, the two calls of the same maturity, strike uh, K1 and K2. And so the value at maturity will only depend on the final spot price, like this. So we have uh, three cases to consider here for the final stock price. Either it ends up below K1, between K1, K2, or above K2. So in the, and we look at the, those corresponding cases here in this uh, X and Y representation, which are, correspond to the first, uh, the K1 option and the K2 uh, call option. So if uh, the final spot price is below K1, so it means that both options end out of the money, and so you're, uh, you will be here. If you're between K1 and K2, so K1 is in the money, so it gains in value, but K2 is still out of the money, so you know, the value there is zero, you're still on the, uh, this horizontal line. Beyond K2, so both options gain in value and you have this payoff. So this describes the manifold tomorrow, sorry, at maturity, uh, indexed by one parameter, which is the stock price. So now, um, what is the convex hull of this thing? It is this kind of uh, infinite band uh, here. And so it means that if the price today is outside of it, like either here, or there, then you can make money. So for instance, uh, if it is uh, here, you separate by your, uh, by your hyperplane in dimension two, so it's a line, as you have to separate from this thing that goes to infinity, there's only one possibility, uh, which, uh, no sorry, because it's not infinite on the other side. So you can take any separating line uh, here, like uh, for instance, this one here, uh, that uh, corresponds to a portfolio where you buy the K1 option, you sell the K2 option, and uh, you make money here and you lose money there, but you know that anyway you will end up uh, uh, on, on this line. So now let's look at uh, another situation where you have a um, uh, few parameters to describe a whole collection of different uh, sets. It uh, appears in the, in the case of interpolating from, for instance, from a few market maturities that are quoted. And so if you have an interpolation for, uh, if, you, if you quote actually prices for any intermediate maturities, typically it's done through a parametric interpolation. And uh, um, very often what the market is doing, so it, it is to assume that uh, the instantaneous forward values are piecewise constant between two given maturities. It happens with instantaneous forward rates or if you have a term structure of variance swaps, for instance, typically a classical um, interpolation will consist in assuming that uh, these instantaneous forward variances are piecewise constant between the quoted maturities. Same things for the CDS, uh, curve where the hazard rate will be assumed to be piecewise constant. So we'll see that we have a problem if the market quotes actually are uh, not in calendar maturities, like uh, for instance, uh, uh, end of the year, but rather in relative maturity, like one month, two months, and so on. So let's look at a simple example, for instance, with instant, instant, instantaneous uh, for uh, the rates here. If um, you, you look at, um, so it's a market that, that quotes in a relative uh, maturity. So let's assume that you have uh, different values uh, for uh, just around a market uh, maturity like this. 
So it means uh, that for 30 days uh, counted from, uh, from today, uh, the red dot here is below the, um, the, the green one. So tomorrow, everything will have shifted by one day, and both those days 30 and 31 from today will become, uh, in relative maturities, 29 and 30 days. So they will fall into the first bucket, and they will be priced by this inter interpolation at the same level. So we don't know whether it will be above or before the precedent uh, levels, but we know that the, the, the spread here, which was uh, positive, if you count uh, the 31 minus the 30 dates, it will go to zero. So you make sure money by selling it. So here you have a problem of consistency, of a stability by a shift. So here the result is that if you use an interpolation which is linear in the parameters, so be careful, it doesn't mean it's linear in maturities, but linear in the parameters. So it means that it will be of this shape. So what we had here, it was a linear combination of uh, just the step functions in general. So if, you, if we use a linear parameterization, so linear summation of basis functions uh, here, uh, we, we will see the conditions that you have on those basis functions. So here, uh, it means that at any point in time, the, the term structure of uh, the, the forwards here will belong to the linear space generated by those basis functions. And this, uh, this space needs to have a stability by the shift uh, operator. So it means that for any um, shift in time, including very small ones, so th the functions still need to belong to the same space. If you do it with infinitesimal shifts, then it means that actually the derivative in maturity of these functions have to belong to the same space. And so you can redo it, and all the derivatives have to belong to the same space, but it's a space of finite dimension. So it means eventually you have a linear combination um, of uh, the, those um, uh, different uh, derivatives equal to zero. So, which means that they satisfy a system of uh, ODEs, and actually uh, the, the final result is that it has to be a linear combination of exponentials possibly uh, multiplied by polynomials. So again, in short, if you want to have an interpolation scheme of for, for all the uh, maturities, which is uh, stable through the shift, so it means it's expressed in terms of relative maturity, and if it's a linear combination of basis uh, functions, then they need to have this uh, shape here, which is almost what happens, for instance, with a classical model used to interpolate uh, yield curves, for instance, the nelson Siegel uh, model, um, except that um, the, um, there's something that breaks the, the linearity, which is the, uh, the, uh, the, that the exponent itself may, may change. And after some uh, computations, so you can show that uh, this is actually arbitrageable. So now, well, as uh, it's not a one hour uh, uh, talk, I, I've uh, suppressed a couple of things uh, just for you to, to know. It was uh, the risk management assumptions uh, that, that are made. So a bank very often has to make some assumptions about what would happen to, for instance, the implied volatility curve if the spot price moves by some, some quantity. And so either you assume that um, uh, the, the classical market assumptions are either a sticky strike, so it means the spot price may change, but the implied volatilities do, do not change, or sticky delta, which is that uh, nothing changes in moneyness terms, in relative maturity. But in both cases, you reprice, actually, you assume that all this collection of options will depend today, tomorrow, just on one parameter, which will be the spot price tomorrow. So it's another example of a high dimensional uh, price vector, but the manifold is just of uh, dimension one, and typically those do generate uh, arbitrage. So now I show uh, something quite interesting. 
So it's, can we arbitrage Black-Scholes? So what does it mean? So in, we know that Black-Scholes with a fixed volatility is an arbitrage-free model. The question here is uh, if you adopt this model every day, but you change the volatility level from one day to the next one, does it lead to some problem? So in other words, it means if you assume that on a certain market, uh, the uh, volatility surface is flat every day, but the level may change, can you make money out of it? So uh, it's not purely academic, the, the concern. Um, so here it's what I said before, it's um, uh, the, um, uh, the fact that in black shorts we have in any model, we have model parameters and we have state variables. In Black Scholes, the, the model parameter is a volatility supposed to be fixed and it's driving the dynamics of the state variable, the spot price. And so now we are going to see what happens when this uh, parameter is changing. But again, it's not a purely academic question. You have some markets, like for instance, uh, commodity market, here it's copper, where the skew is quite flat, but it can change a lot from one day to the next one. Here in two days, basically, it moved from 21% to 25%, still remaining quite flat. So the question is, can you make money in a situation like this? And um, if, uh, if yes, so it means that you should maybe rethink it the way you, you interpolate or model things. So um, for quite a few years, I thought it was quite easy to show that it, it was, uh, yes, arbitrageable, but actually uh, there was a sort of a hole in the, in the argument, or actually, basically the argument was assuming a diffusive world, which is not necessarily the case. So imagine that we have this market um, where every day the black shorts flat, uh, skew is flat. So here, uh, for the purpose of illustration, I simplify into the Bachelier model. So normal model as opposed to log normal one, it's more symmetric. In that case, what you do, you combine two simple uh, portfolios of options. One will be an at the money straddle, a call plus a put both at the money, mm, so it's a V-shaped, and uh, the other one, it's another symmetric shape. It is a, a strangle, so which is uh, a call plus a put, so it's something like this here, uh, symmetric with respect to the money. So this allows you to kill quite a few um, uh, Greeks, so derivatives here. Uh, like as it's, um, so here it's a derivative with respect to those uh, uh, parameters, to spot price volatility and uh, time, and the second derivatives here, because from it to a formula, it's what you need. And um, so the straddle being symmetric and the strangle being symmetric of zero delta, zero vana, which is a second derivative with respect to spot price and volatility. And um, if you combine those two portfolios into, um, uh, in such a way that you cancel the gamma of the option, the second derivative with respect to the spot price. So if you take them with the same maturity, you have a proportionality between the vega, the gamma, and the theta. If you kill the gamma, you kill the other ones, and eventually you have zeros everywhere except the uh, volga, which is the second derivative with respect to the volatility. The convexity in volatility is positive. This portfolio corresponds to um, profile like this, so I used to call it the W arbitrage, looks like a W. Um, <coughs> you kill all the derivatives except the second one. <coughs> so this is true if you assume um, Ito diffusions for those parameters, S and V, but it's not true in general. So here I have a representation of uh, here it is the value of this portfolio as a function of the residual variance. So it means the square of the volatility times the residual maturity uh, and the spot price uh, here. So in those variables, it follows the heat equation. And uh, I'm here today. Blue means positive and uh, green uh, negative here. So I have a zero derivative here, zero derivative there and actually a proper con convexity in this uh, direction. 
Still, uh, you have those regions here, and they arrive, uh, oh, sorry, uh, vertically, uh, where uh, actually you do have negative uh, values. And when you think of it, actually, you realize that it's inevitable. If you have everything with the same maturity, which means that the, um, you can reduce to those uh, two variables. Just by a simple application of the maximum principle, it's a minimum principle here, but basically you cannot have a situation where the value is zero here and it's positive ar around. So the maximum principle will tell you that then the, 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 value, the, the value today cannot be zero. So to make it work, if to have any hope to make it work, you will need to add up some maturities. So, and it will work, actually. So, uh, if you look at, we are back to Black-Scholes, so here, if I look at a, a payoff, which is uh, the, uh, giving a logarithmic profile, so it means um, at maturity, it gives you the log of s, so the value today as a function at time a small t, as a function of s and sigma, is um, the, this quantity here. So now, if you take the difference of two such profiles for, with two different maturities, so you erase the dependence in the spot price and you have something that purely depends on sigma. So it's uh, basically half, uh, minus half of the variance here. So, and now if you do the same thing with a log square, a pair of that gives you the log, uh, the final log squared, then the price today has this shape here, and now you have to do something a bit more tricky to combine three different maturities uh, here to extract eventually something which is the square of the variance of over four. And now we are going to combine those two portfolios, the log and the log squared, in such a way, uh, so the uh, log square allowed you to capture the variance by taking minus two of it, and the log, uh, sorry, the, that's, the log gives you the variance, and the log squared, the variance squared. So if you combine them appropriately, you find a position that actually uh, gives you the change of variance squared. So it's a position that is insensitive to the spot price and to the time, provided it is before the first maturity. So if the Volatility level changes at any time. You capture this quantity here without any assumption of uh, how it moved. You don't need to assume it was um, uh, diffusive. So I will finish with uh, arbitraging uh, Heston uh, here. So the Heston model has a, it's a stochastic volatility model. V is the instantaneous variance following um, the CIR uh, square root process here with a correlation. So typically our parameters here are the mean reversion, the speed of mean reversion, the level to which it mean reverts, and uh, the volatility of volatility here, plus the correlation between the volatility and uh, the spot price. It generates implied volatility surfaces like this. So now the trick is to play with the to, to simplify these complex things, to look at just the term structure of variances. Actually, expected value as small t of the instantaneous variance at time capital T is, um, is equal, uh, sorry, something I've not said uh, before for the Black-Scholes, that this log profile can be constituted by just portfolios of options, so the whole thing works just by combining uh, European type option and here it will be the same thing for to capture the instantaneous variance. And so you, you can do it by uh, looking at a portfolio of two log profiles that are separated by a small maturity. So it was in my uh, 92 paper, uh, arbitrage pricing with uh, stochastic volatility. And so in the Heston model, this, um, the instantaneous forward variance computer small t for capi uh, maturity capital T as this shape, and uh, it can be written like this. So now we can observe that actually, if I look at the difference of those two quantities between two maturities, uh, so this spread actually um, 
has a geometry, um, it evolves in a geometric progression when you, you move from maturities uh, T to T and to T, 3T, 3T, 4D. So if I call uh, X, Y, Z, those three spreads, they are in geometric progression, so which, which means we can write them like this. And actually, for us, more conveniently, it will be um, uh, expressed in that, that shape. So X, Y, and Z are actually uh, tradable. And uh, when you look at it like this, so it tells you that um, this can be seen as a cone if you use as variables y and x, uh, x minus z. So it's a cone, so essentially means the geometry of it will be uh, something like this here, more or less. And um, if you're here, then you can build a tangent hyperplane such a way that you lose money there and you make money uh, there. And so typically, if you move just along this line, that, that will correspond to a change of the spot value or the, the volatility value. You don't make money, you don't lose money, you're still within the model. But if you change in the other direction, which is essentially a change of mean reversion, you capture the convexity in, the, in this dimension. Okay, so, uh, yeah, here, here yeah, you, you can see it. Uh, yeah, I, I have to say, it is an arbitrage if the, the sign of the slope of the term structure does not change. So, uh, if uh, using terminology from the commodity market, this corresponds to a contango uh, term structure, and this is backward addition. So, provided you don't move from one to the other one, you will have an arbitrage. The global geometry is actually two cones uh, like this. And so actually the convex hull of it will be the, the whole space. But if you keep just one of the cones, uh, then you can create your tangent hyperplane and um, uh, the corresponding arbitrage portfolio. Okay, so in short, very good, yeah. Uh, so. We have, um, we witnessed on the market systematic use of parameterization <coughs> for many different reasons. So either for interpolation purpose or for automation. You have plenty of uh, quantities that needs to be moved uh, together. And actually parameterization in itself is a good thing to avoid that prices go all over the place and are misaligned create directly static arbitrage. But uh, you have to be careful about the choice of the parameterization because it easily generates, uh, actually, dynamic arbitrage. So in short, uh, as you've seen, um, the, the, the basic logic, uh, the principle is that we operate in a high dimensional space, but having a parameterization with few parameters means that the possible prices will be of a, on a manifold of low dimensions. And uh, the, the, the question is to know whether the parameterization that you're choosing is generating arbitrage, the rule being that the, uh, you should not be able to separate the current price vector from the manifold, or in other words, you should make sure that the current vector price is within the convex hull of the manifold uh, tomorrow. Okay, so I will, um, so you know, in short, you can say the classical, uh, many market choices, surprisingly, are actually leaving free convexity on the table that can virtually be captured by uh, combining the existing tradable asset in some ways. Okay, thank you. Thank you.